So when I got the uh, topic from Ikna, so I didn't make up that topic. If you all were reading it, you probably thought I was the one. It wasn't me. It's like that Shaggy song. It wasn't me. <laughs> it sounds like me, though. See? Somebody knew exactly who I was. And, but it spoke to me. I got fired up. I got so excited. I was like, Ikna finally knows who I am, knows my lexicon, and I'm just really excited to be here. So... I don't even know where to start, but I'm going to start here. I'm probably the most hated activist in America. And I'm not just talking about the most hated Muslim activist. I'm talking about any kind of activist. I have a very wide range of opposition. The opposition ranges from the alt-right, or the people that have dubbed themselves the alt-right, so basically right-wing white supremacists, to right-wing Zionists, to believe it or not, some liberals and progressives who can't fathom to see a Muslim woman in hijab and they're trying to figure out how could I be a feminist and a Muslim at the same time. I also got a couple of haters in the Muslim community. I ain't gonna lie about that one. Don't think this, uh, this, this work that I do is smooth sailing in the Muslim community. There are still people who haven't come to terms with me. So my opposition is all the way from the left to the right. And in particular after the Women's March, and Brother Hassan talked about this, you know, it was a very strategic opportunity for me. I don't do things, sisters and brothers, without thinking a thousand times about the thing that I'm going to participate in. And when the Women's March emerged, it emerged first organized by white women. And look, the white women could have had a great march. They probably could have figured out how to get hundreds of thousands of people on the streets. It would have been great. We may have even joined and went and participated. But for me as a Muslim American woman, I didn't want to just have a seat at the table. I wanted to be at the center of the table. And I wanted people in our country to visibly see Muslim American women who were involved in the organizing and the leadership of the Women's March. But not only did I want them to see Muslim women who are visible, I also wanted to be part of setting the agenda. So, if we let the white women do it by themselves, they would have done a march about equal pay and reproductive rights. In fact, two issues that I greatly appreciate and I also care about. I think women should get paid the same as men in this country. Sounds pretty basic to me. I also believe in my heart, regardless of what people, from a religious perspective, what your opinion is about reproductive rights or abortion, that doesn't really matter to me in this context. What I hope we can all agree on, that we shouldn't allow government, and especially not one that's led majority by men, to be legislating what any woman does with her body, right? So I care about those two issues. But I also care about a lot of other issues. And when I started thinking about the community that I come from, a very diverse Muslim community that includes African Americans and Africans and refugees and immigrants and intergenerational and poor people and different types of professionals, all kinds of things. We represent, sisters and brothers, the most diverse racial and ethnic makeup of any faith community. So I thought to myself, what would the black Muslim mother in Baltimore, if I asked her what was her priority issue, she's probably not going to say equal pay. She's going to say, I want my son to be able to leave my home every morning and come home to me safely without getting shot by either another person in our community or by the cops. And if I asked an undocumented Pakistani or Guatemalan Muslim woman in our community, she's probably not going to tell me reproductive rights is my issue. She's going to say, I want to come home safely to my family. I want to keep my family united. And I don't want ICE agents to come and rip me apart from my family because I'm undocumented. I started thinking about Muslim moms who want their children to be able to go to public schools and be able to feel safe in whatever environment that they were in. Or Muslims in our community who need access to Medicare and Medicaid and health care. So for me, it was very important for me to bring my intersectional lens, which by the way, sisters and brothers, this whole new term intersectionality that you guys have been hearing about within the last like year and a half, first and foremost, it's a word that was dubbed by a black woman named Dr. Le Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. So let's give credit where it's due, where that term originated from. 
I've been doing intersectional organizing for 17 years. I didn't need a movement, I didn't need a hashtag, I didn't need some new phenomenon to understand that we have to organize at the intersections of oppression. You can't talk about Sisters and Brothers racial justice without talking about economic justice. Can't talk about economic justice without, without talking about immigrant rights or talking about reproductive rights or talking about education. All of these things, Sisters and Brothers, are connected. Remember, we are whole people and we are impacted by a lot of issues. So my philosophy in organizing is don't ask me to leave out any part of my identity. Don't ask me to show up for what you care about. You got to give me space to show up for what I care about. And keeping the space broad enough so that people can see themselves in the campaign, in the issue, in the march, in whatever it is that you are putting forward. So because of all of that, right after the Women's March, and Brother Hassan said it, there were four, listen, there were actually 50 women who are part of the national organizing for the Women's March in Washington, D.C. That's the first fact. The second fact is we had about 400 organizers around the country that were organizing sister marches pretty much in every major city in America and in fact in not major cities in America. There were people marching in places where nobody ever marched before. Then there were probably about a thousand globally. On every continent in the world, there were people that were organizing a system art. So let's be clear here, it wasn't just these four women. It was over 1,500 women globally who organized the largest single day protest in US history. Now, but the, vis the visible leaders, the people in the newspapers, the people that were representing the march and its agenda were for women mostly. It was myself, Tamika Mallory, who's African-American, Christian, Carmen Perez, who's a Chicana Mexican woman, and Bob Bland, who's a white woman. So the, the Women's March happens on Saturday, everything's fabulous, the country's inspired, everybody's hopeful again after we just had elected a sexist, misogynist, racist, Islamophobe, and I can go on from here. Um, and for us to show up the next morning and ignite some passion in our country and to remind our country that there actually still is a couple of good people out here. It fueled the opposition. Now there was four of us. Why do you think that the opposition woke up on Monday morning and Linda Sarsour was the headline? I literally was the headline for every major alt-right media outlet in America. Every celebrity alt-right leader in America had my name in their mouth. And I thought to myself, why me? Why not Tamika? Why not Carmen? Why not Bob Bland? And then it immediately came to me. How dare I? How dare I be unapologetically Muslim? How dare I stand up on a stage unapologetically Palestinian American, donning a hijab and being so courageous and have so much pride in the community that I come from? How dare I? That really was, was what it was, sisters and brothers. It was nothing about what I said and who I was or what work I have done. I've been doing organizing work for 17 years. Nothing new. I've been Muslim since the day I was born. That was not new either. I was also Palestinian the minute I came out of my mother's womb. So it wasn't like they were attacking any new identities that I, that I somehow created when I got to the Women's March. But what I did was is I passed the line for them. It was okay when I was organizing in New York. It was okay when I went on MSNBC a couple of times. You know, they were like, there's a little threshold for her. She's like, you know, on this threshold, but we gonna let her slide. But then when I got to the Women's March, I crossed the line. How dare I stand on a stage inspiring a nation as a Muslim American woman? How dare I stand on a stage with words that resonated with people outside of my community? How dare I stand on a stage where people who never met me, maybe never even met a Muslim, were applauding the words that I was saying as I was standing up for the communities that I come from. So the opposition was not having it. And over the course of the past year and a half, sisters and brothers, I have seen things that I didn't ask for. I didn't sign up for death threats. I didn't sign up for trolling online every single day. I didn't sign up for people to send mail to my mother's house and send me pictures of my children. I didn't sign up for that. 
But I thought about it a little bit more. And what makes this crazy also, it's not just the alt-right. I have the son of the President of the United States of America, Donald Trump Jr., who's obsessed with me. Literally. Like, you are the son of the President, what, why do you give a damn about a citizen that lives in New York? Don't worry about what I'm doing. The fact that he actually uses his social media platform to attack me tells me a lot. It actually tells me I'm doing the right thing. And every time I'm doing something and Donald Trump Jr. is not talking about it, I gotta step it up a little bit more. So, over the course of the year and a half, every day, I'm not even exaggerating, sisters and brothers, it's like clockwork. Every other Tuesday. I'm telling you, starting from now, it's not gonna be next Tuesday, it's gonna be the Tuesday after. Just go online, something new. Sharia law advocate, member of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, calling for holy wars against the president. Sister Linda said this, I said this 20 years ago. Things I didn't even say, oftentimes it's actually things I didn't even do, but they don't care. So their mission is to intimidate and silence me. But what they don't know, and it's hard for somebody who's not Muslim to understand these concepts, I'm not afraid of them. I don't have any fear in my heart, sisters and brothers. Does it bother me sometimes? It does, I'm not gonna lie to you. It's a little bit too much. But what they don't understand about Muslims, I don't do this work for them. I don't do this work to please people. And the only fear that I have in my heart is the fear of Allah. They don't understand that concept. So they think that they can instill fear in our hearts by putting out flyers like punish a Muslim day. I dare you is my response to punish a Muslim day. I dare them. What I'm trying to say to you sisters and brothers is that all of the things that I explain, and this is something that I personally deal with, and I know that a lot of Muslim American leaders, particularly those that work in organizations like CARE, I mean, we have been on surveillance lists, and we watched uh, two years ago when we saw Brother Nihad Awad's name on one of the top suspected terror watch lists in America, and it was in the newspapers. Like, we know these things happen to our community. But we can't stop. We can't let the opposition allow us to retreat back and to be ashamed of who we are or go back into the shadows. We, don't, we shouldn't allow them to have that type of power over us. And this is why I'm pretty sure the right wing and the right wing Zionists, they probably wake up every morning and say to themselves, what in the hell do we got to do to this lady to knock her out of this picture? It's, whatever we're doing is just not working. And it actually goes back to something that Imam Hassan said, and I want you to really absorb what he was telling you. Not only do we have a collective responsibility to work with other members of the human family for the betterment of the human family, which could include non-Muslims, it could include atheists, it could include anybody. Anybody that wants to see the betterment of the society that we are in, anyone who's trying to create a society where we are all treated with dignity and respect, I'm going to work with you. That's my bar. My bar is as long as you respect me as a Muslim, as long as you do not impose your values and principles on me and ask me to change myself, and you want to see the betterment of the neighborhood or the community or the country that I live in, you're my ally. That's it, very basic system, brother. Don't put too much conditions on people. Don't say I will only organize with these kind or this. That's not, number one, it ain't Islam, and number one, it ain't effective. So for me, the reason why I still stand is because of the coalitions that I built. It's hard for people who see my opposition and say to themselves, I don't know man, this lady, she's been mobilizing Muslims to stand with undocumented people. This woman sat at the feet of black mothers in America who have lost their children to police violence. This is a woman who has raised money with her colleagues for burnt black churches, for synagogues that have been vandalized. We really can't hate her too much because this woman has shown up. This woman has built alliances. This woman has brought her Muslim community to the table on economic justice, on racial justice issues, to end police brutality. We're going to have a hard time being part of the opposition here because this woman has been with us. So what, the, what, what I'm saying to you all as a collective community is that you as Muslims, you're not enough. 
you really are not enough. I'm going to be generous and say that we're probably about 5 million Muslims in America. And that's a, ge that's a generous estimate. 5 million out of 340 million Americans, you're just not enough. So not only do we do good for our so society and stand up for justice regardless who the injustices are being committed against, because it's the Islamic thing to do and because it is the right thing to do, but it's also an opportunity for us to build partnerships and alliances and coalitions so that when something bad happens to us, people come to us and people stand with us. Sisters and brothers, it wasn't magic when the week after the Women's March, people flooded the airports to say they stand with Muslims and to let the refugees in and let the Muslims in. That's not magic. That didn't happen because you were sitting at your house and people just randomly got out their houses and went to the airports. That was years of coalition work that we have built as Muslim American organizers and leaders. That work that you saw, you are reaping the benefits of the people in your community at Mass, at Ikna, Imam Hassan and the work that he's doing and organizers like Imam Hassan all over this country. So when you see these things and you're so happy and you're like, MashaAllah, this is so amazing, don't think that was magic. I want you to make dua for the people in your community that are risking everything and sacrificing everything to ensure that you remain a full and whole and safe Muslim in America. That's the work that these type of people that spoke to you today are doing every single day. The other thing about you know, this idea of haters are going to hate. Haters are always going to hate. On a college campus, sometimes the haters are going to be in your family. People are going to say to you, why are you wasting your time? Why are you giving yourself a headache? Because sometimes the Muslim community is a headache. Sometimes they make me work harder than I have to. I, don't, I shouldn't have to convince Muslims about economic justice and working to raise the living wage. I shouldn't have to convince you that the issue of DACA and giving pathway to citizenship to undocumented people is a Muslim issue. I shouldn't have to, every single time a black man or woman is shot by a police officer, I gotta tell you black lives matter. That's too much work, sisters and brothers. And even, uh, even on this Stefan Clark, Listen, sisters and brothers, I'm never surprised when a black man or woman is shot by a police officer unarmed in this country. I'm just never surprised. But I'm outraged every single time. And I don't give a damn if they're Muslim or not. And I want you to reflect on this particular story. And sometimes I always think to myself, Allah does everything for a reason. Nothing is just random. God is not random. God, in my opinion, must have loved Stefan Clark that much that he took him early. He took, it was his time to go. And Allah chose Stefan Clark, a black Muslim man. And I thought to myself, maybe God chose him as a black Muslim man to wake up our Muslim American community. Because you shouldn't care that Stephon Clark was murdered. Not, he wasn't murdered, Sister Zimmer. He was massacred by the Sacramento Police Department. When the brothers tried to give him the ritual washing, they couldn't even wash his body. So they had to do tayammum because they couldn't wash that young man's body. You shouldn't care all of a sudden about Stefan Clark because he, you found out he was a Muslim. You should have been outraged when you just knew he was a black man getting shot by the Sacramento Police Department. Of course, those of us who cared anyway, of course we felt even more overwhelmed to know not only was he part of our human family and our American family, but now he was part of our faith family. So I hope that this Stefan Clark which we hope that him and his family will get justice on this earth, but I know he will get justice in the hereafter. But I need you to reflect on our response as a Muslim American community when black and brown people get killed at the hands of law enforcement. I don't care who they are, where they live, that is always your issue, every single time. Now, something else that is 
drives the opposition crazy is exactly those things. When we start making the intersection, when we start connecting the dots, they don't want you to connect the dots. They're very happy for immigrant Muslims to not see or, or organize with or build community with, with black Muslims. You think they don't like that? They love it. Any type of division, any type of divide amongst communities only plays into the hands of the opposition. But let me tell you about the opposition. When the opposition wants to vandalize a mosque, they don't care if the mosque is a Shia mosque or a Sunni mosque. They don't care if the imam is from Egypt and studied at Al-Azhar or he came from Pakistan or he's a homegrown imam. When they want to assault a Muslim sister in hijab on a college campus, nobody, the guy who's going to do it ain't going to tap you on the shoulder and say, excuse me, are you from Bangladesh or Pakistan? They don't care. They don't care if you were born here, not born here. They don't care if you are a PhD student or you go to community college. The opposition does not care what kind of Muslim you are. So if our opposition is treating us like we are one community, when are we going to start acting like we're one community? I don't understand. The other thing the opposition, opposition doesn't like, they don't like people who have charisma and eloquence and people who know how to put an argument forward. Because the minute you put an eloquent argument forward that they can't respond to, they're very simple people. They go to ad hominem attacks. They start trying to attack your character. I'm going to give you an example. Who remembers a guy by the name of Congressman Allen West? Do you remember that name? Anybody remember that name? Allen West was a congressman from Florida one of the top Islamophobes in the country. He was like best friends with Michelle Bachman. And I remember he was so Islamophobic that the Muslim community in Florida built some coalitions, raised some money, and voted his you-know-what out of office. And then he went missing for a couple of years. Like, I don't even know what happened to him. I didn't see him anywhere on TV. His social media was pretty quiet. Then all of a sudden, a couple of weeks ago, brother emerged. And he was thinking to himself, OK, so how am I going to make myself relevant again? Ah, I know. I'm going to go after this Muslim lady named Linda. That's really going to put me in the newspaper. So this is what he came after me. This is what he woke up one morning, and he had a revelation. He said, I know what I'm going to get Linda on. You know, she's out here trying to act like she's a feminist. I got her this time. So, Linda, this is, I'm, he tweeted this at me, by the way. I wrote a whole blog, and I screenshotted everything so you can check it out. And he said, so, Linda Sarsour, feminist leader of the Women's March, where are you on your sisters in Iran who are being forced into mandatory hijab? Where are you on that? First of all, brother, I've been talking about that for weeks before you ever came back to social media. But anyway, since you missed it, they thought that what they're trying to do and what Alan West is trying to do to Muslim women in America or in the West is they're trying to put us up against the wall. They think I don't know how to argue this point. So I wrote a blog post. I said, you know what? I'm going to respect you, former congressman, and I'm going to respond to what you have to say. I said, as a Muslim woman who wears hijab, I am in opposition to any government who forces women to wear hijab. Because hijab is about choice. And no government should be in the business of telling me to wear hijab or not wear hijab. And I said to him that I can hold two positions. Because I'm not going to allow people to put me in the position where they want me to say that hijab is a form of oppression. I said, you know what? I could be against mandatory veiling, right? But are you, Congressman Allen West, against a country like France who actually doesn't allow women to wear hijab in public university or to work in public sector jobs? Or are you just a hypocrite who's anti-Muslim who can't put an argument together? And when other people who are not Alan West read my blog post, even people sometimes who are on, in the opposition were really taken aback. They were like, damn, this lady's too nuanced. She's right. We're kind of hypocrites because if, we're, if you're going to be against Iran for mandatory veiling, you better be against the country of France who's asking us to take our hijabs off. And that we can actually hold the position of believing that hijab is a form of empowerment and for me, a very important part of my identity and who I am. 
and at the same time be able to say that Iran shouldn't be forcing women to wear hijab and shouldn't be imprisoning women who choose to take off their hijabs. So the threat is how dare we be eloquent? How dare we be able to put two sentences together? How dare we be able to challenge the opposition? So the opposition is really just mad at us for breathing and existing. I can't really think of why there would be so much opposition to seeing Muslim women rise in America in the way that we are now in such a visible way other than we shadow every stereotype that has been propagated by the opposition at least for the past 16 years since the horrific attacks of 9-11. Now, what do I do? I keep it moving. I don't got time for the opposition. We got a lot of work to do in the Muslim community. And if you're going to stop every time uh, an administrator at your college campus is against you in a campaign, every time another college group like, you know, right-wing Zionist groups are attacking you on the college campus and you say, oh, I'm not going to khalas, like, I can't take this anymore, that's exactly what they want you to do. In fact, when you say, I'm, I don't have time for them anymore and I'm just not going to do this anymore, you literally have given them exactly what they wanted. When Muslim organizations say, we're going to change this campaign or we're going to change that and this because we don't want opposition, you're exactly giving the opposition what they want. And I'm going to end with this one story about haters and opposition and how I decided to respond in that moment. Just to give you a tangible example. So, And I tell the story everywhere because this story is, when I'm 80 years old, I'm still going to tell the story. That's how much the story really went deep inside of me. I went to Isna last year and I was the keynote speaker at the luncheon. Everything was fine, beautiful. There was like 500 people, most of whom were leaders of the Muslim community. It was a fundraiser for ISNA. I was the keynote. I spoke. Everything was great. Wonderful. So this is what I said as part of what I, you know, as part of my lecture at that, at that particular luncheon. I was trying to motivate the Muslim community after the Donald Trump presidency, you know, telling the Muslim community, you know how I do, right? Y'all got to be unapologetic. We got to be out here fighting in these streets. We have nothing to be afraid of. We got everything to be proud of. The usual stuff that I say. And then I shared a story with them. It's part of a hadith that I have heard. Even Mazin has said this once before. This is a hadith that I've heard across Masajid, across America. Sheikh Yasser Qadi has said it. Imam Suhaib Webb has said it. Imam Umar, everybody. So you know me, I'm not a theologian and I'm not an Islamic scholar, but sometimes I like to share things that inspire me or a hadith that I've heard that move me. So I shared this one. I said there was a man who asked our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him, what is the best form of jihad or struggle? And our beloved Prophet Muhammad responded and said the best form of jihad or struggle is a word of truth to a tyrannical ruler. That's it. That's all I said. Everybody clapped. The luncheon was over. We all went home. The next morning I wake up, I'm trending on Twitter. The son of the president is tweeting about me. People are calling for me to be arrested in treason. They said that I was calling for a holy war against the president of the United States of America. Wallahi al I'm not even lying. Like, this was like every major media outlet. It wasn't on the fringes anymore. So you know me, I'm sitting at home and in the morning when I woke up, people in the Muslim community were texting me being like, are you okay, Sister Linda? Do you need anything? And I said, what happened? I literally just woke up. I didn't even know what happened. And immediately I knew. I said, I got to go to Twitter. Something happened at Isla. And then I was like the trending picture on top for 25 hours. So during the day, I had some very well-meaning brothers, and I love them dearly, people who have sacrificed for our community, who I know were worried about me, and they had my best interest at heart. So they called me up, Salaamu Alaikum, Sister Linda, if you need anything, we are here for you, but Sister Linda, you gotta be careful. You can't be saying words like jihad. You can't do this, and you can't do that, and you gotta do... You know, and I let them speak, and I, I heard them out, and I appreciated them, and I said, thank you so much for sharing your concerns with me. Assalamu alaikum. Then I saw other Muslims in our community, and I'm not going to mention any names, but basically very cowardly Muslims that chose to appease white folks and appease those who are afraid of words like jihad and sharia, while their Muslim sister was being attacked viciously. One day their names will appear, and some of you may already know who they are. But they have done other things in our community that you wouldn't be proud of either, so you don't have to worry about them. Anyhow, I sat and I reflected for a little bit. And I said to myself, I have a choice to make in this moment, right? 
I got to decide how I'm going to respond because there, everybody was talking about me without me. So this is what I decided to do, sisters and brothers. Double down. In that moment, when I heard, thought about the opposition and all these people up in arms about using a word like jihad, you know what I said to myself? I said, absolutely not, not on my watch. I will not let our opposition and those who do not respect our deen, those who are anti-Muslim to define what words I'm allowed to use and what words I'm not allowed to use. How are we as a community going to allow Islamophobes and right-wing Zionists to tell me how to practice my religion? How am I going to stand before my Lord as people are telling me, well, your prophet is contra... Sisters and brothers, that, that hadith I said, number one, ain't even contra... It ain't even the spiciest of them all. I could pull out some other spicy ones if you really wanted. That wasn't even that controversial. But imagine us sitting with that and, and saying, you know what, maybe our prophet is a little controversial. Maybe we shouldn't be proud and be able to preach the beautiful words and the seed of our beloved prophet who inspires us to be the people that we are today. Absolutely not. I wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post. And I said, you know what, I'm not going to allow people to speak for me. I'm going to speak for myself. And in that op-ed, I doubled down. And I said, you know what, I'm going to say whatever it is that I want to say. Because I don't tell Christians how to practice their faith. I don't tell Jews how to practice their faith. I don't tell Sikhs and Buddhists and anybody else from other faiths how to practice theirs. So I'm not going to allow anybody to tell me how to practice mine. And you know what happened? You know what happened? At that moment, what happened was, all of a sudden, I don't know if people who are on social media noticed, everybody was jihading everywhere. Everybody in our community was bold to post articles explaining to their followers what jihad was. The Huffington Post wrote a beautiful piece about, about the actual true meaning of jihad in the way that we understand it, which really mostly focuses on this idea of internal struggle and an internal struggle towards something that Mazin spoke about, which is excellence. Every day when I wake up, sisters and brothers, I struggle hard to be excellent. You know why? Because my dean does not expect anything less from me but to be an excellent human being and an excellent creation of my Lord. So what I'm saying to you and to close is that don't let anybody define for you who you are and how you choose to show up. Don't any, and let anybody define your dean for you and how you practice your religion freely. And don't worry what the opposition has to say about you because in this country, history has taught us that anybody who is unapologetic about who they are Anybody who stands up for the rights of the communities that they come from is going to be vilified. This year, next week, April 4th, 2018, is the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. Now everybody's going to commemorate that. Watch. Every right-wing Republican to the most leftist radical in America is going to be like... MashaAllah, Dr. Martin Luther King, which has, to, which has to tell you something. How is it possible that one man can be applauded by people who are in opposition to our values and principles as a country and as a religion, right? They said he was a communist. The, they blacklisted the organizations that he was a part of. The former FBI director at the time, J. Edgar Hoover, called Dr. Martin Luther King the most dangerous man in America. They, he was a victim of police brutality. He wrote you letters from the Birmingham jail. So all I'm saying to you, sisters and brothers, is don't worry what people have to say about you now. Stand in your power. Because 40 years from now, guess what? We're all going to be walking down Colin Kaepernick Boulevard. And then everybody's going to act like they were with Colin Kaepernick when we don't damn sure well a lot of people in our country were not with Colin Kaepernick. So be bold, be brave, and let your haters be your best motivators. Salaamu Alaikum.